Just put it in your pocket, the green light. I flipped the switch and now it's on. Okay, yeah, thank you. Are you about ready to go? So all can so be... I'll, I'll mention these two things. Okay. And then you can feel free to erase them both, okay? Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so let's get started with our uh, next lecture. So just two quick announcements. One is that the public lecture is tonight. Juan Valdezena is delivering a public lecture. It's downstairs in G1B30. This is G130. That's G1B30. Just on the ground floor, it's one of the big lecture halls, the one closer uh, to the parking lot. It'll be at 7.30 tonight. And then the other announcement um, was that if you want to go on the hike and you're not on Facebook, email Jasmine, JT Brewer at MIT.edu uh, for this weekend's hike. So we're happy to have Miranda Chang, who's going to tell us a new set of uh, two lectures, right? Yeah, that's about right. About moonshine. So take it away, Miranda. Um, okay, so um, yeah, two lectures on moonshine. First thing I would like to say is that uh, it's a real pleasure to be lecturing here um, in the Tassi School. I heard that you guys are the future of um, high energy uh, theoretical physics, physics, physics so um, that's uh <laughs> certainly um, an honor. Second, um, yeah, it's on moonshine, so I assume that not many of you, maybe zero, uh, is working on moonshine. So um, I'll try to, you know, um, give a fun introduction on what it's more or less about. But please feel free to interact, interrupt me anytime. And uh, I reserve the right to say, no, let's talk about this later, right? So you don't have to worry about too much, worry, worry too much about asking questions, okay? And so, well, I'll first start with part one. And guess what? The part time, the part one is going to be an introduction. And we will start with the question, what is moonshine? If you're thinking about booze, then uh, it's in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so um, I'll give two answers. The first answer is for non-experts. So. That sound, so which will be an answer that sounds good, okay, hopefully. So I would then say that moonshine refers to a certain connection between two types of mathematical structures that a priori have nothing to do with each other. So one of them is modular objects, which are certain type of objects I'll tell you about later. But uh, in principle, they are functions that have nice infinite symmetries, OK? And the second one is the structure of finite groups. Well. We all know what groups are, we all know what finite groups are, and one way, to, one way that we usually encounter them is as symmetries of something, right? For instance, of an equilateral triangle or square, these have finite group symmetries. And moonshine refers to some kind of connection between these two things. And uh, the first part of lecture, I'll show you a particular example of such an unexpected connection. And the second answer, well, I will give because uh, before coming here, I was in Aspen for in the Center of or for Physics for two weeks, and we have a program on moonshine, and we've been discussing this question extensively. And the consensus among experts seems to know that we don't know really what moonshine is. And I hope that in the second lecture, by the end of the day, I will convey this confusion to you. <laughs> that you will get out more confused than <laughs> you were. Then you understand why it's kind of subtle to say what moonshine is. But this paradigm is 
well, you should keep in mind for the lecture, and which is actually correct. But if you want to make this more concrete, then um, it is um, a little bit hard. Okay, so um, another question is, how about physics? There's not a single word of physics on the board yet, but um, but I'm here hopefully for a reason because there are certain uh, uh, certain certain uh, physical elements in the story. Actually, a very important physical element because seeing this diagram as it is, you're just like, what the hell is going on? We don't understand. But what the successful the success we have had so far in understanding moonshine comes with adding a third point in this diagram, which is some physical theory okay, and they deliver modular objects by computing, for instance, partition function or other physical quantities. And they deliver, is that too small? OK. And they deliver finite groups as the symmetry of the physical theory. And once you establish the theory and the connection to the object, objects you want and the symmetry you want, so all of a sudden, this diagram look, starts making sense, right? OK, of course, if this is a symmetry of the theory, and this is partition function or other correlators of the theory, then the two objects should be connected. So this is the way um, physics have been contributing in the study of moonshine. And in the broader scheme, the study of moonshine by string theorists fits nicely in the subfield in string theory that's called the string math or physical mathematics, or you, heard, you might have heard many words like this, which is, well, to use the intricate structure of string theory, for instance, the compactification, you can have all kinds of color BLs and whatnot in your theory, and here you can gain insight about geometry and for instance, representation theories of groups and algebras, and here, through the connection to the special functions and the number theory. So sometimes the error goes this way. We're using developing new math to gain a better understanding of string theory. Sometimes the error goes this way. We're using physics to solve mathematical problems. So then, after that, will be a little commercial time. Why we care about moonshine? So the reason to address this question on time in the beginning of the lecture is then you can make up your mind for yourself whether this is worth your time or not. <laughs> if it's not convincing, you can ask me. And if I can't give you a convincing answer, then it's not worth your time, right? Well, as we said, first of all, it's a mathematical connection. And it's a connection between two things. And uh, only in a few cases we have an understanding via physical theory in the above way. So most cases of moonshine is still completely mysterious. And it actually points to you know, an unknown paradigm between the two study of two subjects. And uh, so 
you know, the dream is, maybe it's not a true, maybe it will not be true, maybe it will, is that in the future when you talk about, when you teach a class about one thing, you cannot skip mentioning the other because there, so, there are so many examples of moonshine coming up. So we got to understand it and write that textbook, right, eventually, someone. And why are there so many physicists? Well, not so many, but many physicists interested in studying such a connection. Well, first reason, still connections, but now connecting to, for instance, uh, in this diagram, the connection between uh, string theory and geometry is very, uh, has been very successful and very extensive. Um, but the connection to number theory is kind of weak, but many people believe that there should be a stronger and stronger connection there, and this is through the connection to module object, it's a great opportunity to connect to that part of mathematics. And uh, second, inspired by the, the goal to explain moonshine, um, People have been ha having lots of fun searching and studying physical systems or in particular string theory compatibilities uh, with large symmetries, okay? So why do we care about it? Well, first because they're beautiful, they have uh, very distinct uh, properties, but second, you might think like except for uh, besides using supersymmetry and so on, a system with large finite group symmetries will also give you new handles on physics, so you can compute more things than other systems. That's the one of the motivation. And another motivation, which is kind of harder to uh, explain right now, but But many people believe that by studying this paradigm, paradigm, we'll gain a better understanding of the structure of quantum states, as at least those that are protected by supersymmetry. So this I will have to explain once I get to uh, tell you the concrete story of uh, individual moonshine uh, phenomenon. And the second, the third uh, motivation is probably that there's a lot going on. So it's a good time to start uh, looking at, the pro at this topic. Well, first, the first type of development is the discovery of new moonshine, so there seems to be more and more and more examples being uncovered of such different finite groups connecting to different modular objects, and these examples uh, we don't typically don't understand yet. And um, once it's discovered, we are desperately looking for the third corner namely the relevant physical origin of moonshine. And then inspired by this and this, people ha have are also making progress in understanding the symmetry of typically K3-ish, if you know what a K3 is already, So I would say that um, it's an active field on the interface <coughs> between string theory and mathematics. So that's the commercial time. Yeah. Well, um, where should I start? You know what a K3 surface is, right? So you can compatibilize string theory on it. But one thing you can do is that you can compatibilize it on 
you know, k3 times t times s1, k3 times t2, k3 times another circle, t3, and you, you go on like this. Another thing you can do is to look at, you know, orbifold portions of k3, and then you get to some uh, special calabials, or if you are even more bold, and, and uh, you can look at um, heterotic strings on K3, or, you know, K3 fiber calabial two, uh, three folds or four folds, and so on. <coughs> yeah, so um, actually, K3 will not appear anymore uh, till. <laughs> <laughs> besides the, the commercial till later, but um, a brief reminder, one liner is that K3 is the unique uh, Calabial two folds that, are, that is not trivial. Okay, trivial by trivial means it's just product of circle, namely a torus, okay? And torus is too simple, and Calabial three folds is very hard. So K3 is like, you know, nice laboratory for doing things. Okay, so now we go to the outline. So the the first part of the lecture would be uh, about the physics. I cannot spell physics and math of monstrous moonshine. So the name is getting more and more exciting. Uh, but this moonshine, this case of moonshine, is the one that's best understood, and uh, it's and uh, it's discovered in '79. So that was ancient, right, before you guys were born, and. Um, and then um, people have been working on it until, and uh, in the early 90s, the main conjecture has been proven. Someone got the Fields Medal for it. Everybody's happy. And then the field sort of feels accomplished until 2010. There's a bunch of new examples till now. So people are confused again. Oh, after all, we don't understand moonshine. But this case, people, uh, well, we don't understand everything yet, but we understand the idea. So I would like to uh, use this case to illustrate what the main idea is of moonshine and going through some background, okay? And uh, after that, the second part, well, I already said the first part is intro, so let me add one, one more line. So the third part, I will tell you what's been going on with the new moonshine, so it's going to be much more schematic, but hopefully more um, up to date in that sense. Okay, so now to tell you about this moonshine, I will have to explain these objects a little bit, these boxes. Um, so, what is a finite group? Well, we all know what group is, right? If you have elements A and B, and A times B has to be in it, and uh, there's an inverse, and we know what finite means, namely the group has finally many, uh, many elements, and, um, and uh, finite groups can be decomposed, quote unquote, into simple finite groups. It means that uh, you can take simple finite groups and compose them into uh, uh, a finite group, a general finite group. So they're sort of like the primes in the number. And um, so, of course, there are infinitely many simple finite groups. Well, but the surprising thing is actually that people have actually uh, classified them. So there are three infinite families. For instance, to see that there is infinitely many finite groups, for instance, every uh, cyclic group of prime order is a simple finite group. It cannot be de decomposed further, so that's one of the families. And then there are 26 or 27, depending a little bit on your definition. 
that don't fit in the uh, infinite families, so they're called sporadics. I think the name explain, explains itself. So, um, to explain why, what's so monstrous about the moonshine, because, well, there's the largest one of the uh, sporadics. It's called monster group. And then the, the common notation is this script M. And what's, what's so monstrous about it? Because the number of its element is more or less the same as the number of atoms in the solar system. So it's a humongous group. Well, it's finite, you know, but it's, 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 it's huge. There are so many elements. Um, but uh, fortunately, the conjugacy classes is much smaller. There's only one nine four of them. So that just means like if you know if uh, G and G prime are conjugate to each other, you don't count them twice. And the theorem for simple finite groups tells you then there's one nine four irreducible representations. Namely the representations that cannot be reduced further. So we all know what re representation is, but to set up the notation, let's just say that the representation is a pair. Usually we only talk about the vector space as the representation, but in, in fact we need a row that maps G to, let's say, GLV, right? So then well, the group character then is defined as we usually write it like this, but what it really means is that we're taking the trace of this matrix. Okay. So if you want to know about a finite group, one thing you really want to see is the character table listing all the uh, group, uh, group characters were all the irreducible representations. And because there are as many conjugacy classes, and this is, of course, a uh, class invariance, if G and G prime are conjugate, the character will be the same. And because the, these two numbers are the same, so you get a square matrix that you can invert. Okay? So s for the monster group, there's one, nine, four of them, and I won't give you the 194 times 194 matrix on the board, <laughs> uh, but let me just give you a few entries, okay? E is the identity matrix, right? So this will tells you that uh, the E character, the identity character is just the dimension of the vector space, okay? And the first one, if we order 194, it wraps by their sizes, then uh, the first one is, of course, the trivial representation. And the second one so this also shows um, the difficulty to study the monster group. Not just the size of the group is huge, the, fir the smallest non-trivial representation is also huge. It's kind of hard to write down 196AA3 times 196AA3 matrices, which are what this is about, right? What these are. So it's really hard to study this group a priori. Okay, and finally, well, I'm really not going to write down the number. It's just humongous, but there are one, nine, uh, four of them. Okay. So these are sporadics. Yeah. So, uh, just a question. Is there some, it seems like the nice simple finite group is the sporadic between the monster group and the monster group. Is there any reason to believe that why the distinction even exists? It seems so out of place. 
that's what I was going to write after Q. Great. <laughs> Yeah, you, you're welcome to read the proof. It's about 2,000 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read it. <laughs> yeah, but there is a proof. Yeah, it's actually not, not 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 trivial, right, to claim that there is a proof of such a theorem because I mean, it w you know the proof was announced and then it's like 1,000 pages and then people actually read it and found loopholes in it and then it took another 10 years, another few thousand pages. So. It's um, it's a real, yeah, human endeavor <laughs> to do this. Inhuman endeavor, yeah. So to ask the question, why do these sporadics appear? Why wh what what do they have anything to do with anything? Because as we said, for dihedral group, we understand it as the symmetry of some, you know, some, some, some shapes. And uh, what about, wh what plays the role of these shapes for the sporadics? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is still we don't really know completely. But I can, again, try to give you some um, partial answers. So for many cases, we know that there are special lattices and so on and, and error correcting codes which are closely related that play the role of these very symmetric shapes for dihedral groups for the sporadics. In what sense? Well, one big class of uh, the sporadics, so 26 I can get about, well, I don't know exactly what number, but some, somewhere like 10 from these uh, very nice lattices called Niemeyer lattice. Okay, so the theorem says that there are precisely 24 even self-dual well, as string theorists, we're familiar with even self-dual lattices. They're very good for us in defining uh, moduli invariant partition function and positive definite. So the signature is positive definite lattices uh, in 24 dimensions. So there are two 24s on the board that has nothing to do with each other. So one of them is what's called the leech lattice. And uh, another 23 of them, I'll write, use the notation Nx, where x are sign kind of combinations of ADE or root systems. So a root system of the lattice meaning like the square, the length square two lattice. So uh, which is of course the smallest that's allowed in the even lattice. Okay, and leech is singled out because there's no such uh, small length vectors. Uh, they don't exist. Okay, and what do they have to do with sporadic groups? So you can get uh, seven sporadics from taking subgroup of the symmetry group of the leech lattice. And uh, you can get a few more from here. For instance, let's define its automorphism lattice in this way, in uh, the obvious way, but you mod out by the wild group of the root, because since they're length 2, then square 2, you can define a wild group. And then um, if x is the simplest one in the sense that it's just a bunch of a1s, then uh, gx is 
what's called the M24, um, it's, uh, or MATU24, which is, you know, the more friendly member of the sporadics. It's not as scary, as monstrous as monster, but still very interesting. Okay, so now the question is, how about the monster, for instance? There's no lattice. There's no lattice with this symmetry. What's the natural representation of the monster? And the cool thing about monstrous moonshine is what people say about it, which of course makes some sense, is that the most natural representation with a given certain rep definition for natural is infinite dimensional and is what shows up in monstrous moonshine, as we will see later. Now I sor sort of have explained the first object. I'll try to explain the second object. What are the modular objects? In particular, we'll focus on something that's called modular forms. So what are they? Well, first of all, these are functions on the upper half plane. And we know that upper half plane has a natural symmetry given by SO2R mapping a point to another point in this way. And uh, SO2Z is then the discrete subgroup of SO2R where ABCD has to be integers. So that's one picture, the first picture that's relevant for modular forms. Another picture that's also nice to keep in mind is that SO2Z is, of course, what stabilizes a two-dimensional uh, lattice, right? When you do the ABCD, what you're doing is changing the basis of the lattice, right? For instance, if you write the lattice like this, it's still the same lattice, or the points are the same. And another nice picture to have is that SL2Z uh, Z is a mapping glass group of torus. Well, one way to see that is just if you identify the sides and fill in this space, it becomes a torus. And uh, for instance, one it corresponds to how you slice a bagel. Well, usually people slice it like this. But of course, you can also slice it like this. You just bite in it, right? I don't want jam, I don't want butter, I just want to bite in my bagel and then it becomes like this. So these are SL2Z transformations. So modular forms are, uh, are first of all, um, functions that transform nicely under this group we like. For instance, should I start a new board? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I was all of a sudden feeling German for some reason. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I give you an uh, example of um, of a function that transforms nicely under this. And you just have to uh, believe me. <laughs> so uh, I call it tau, I call it j. So we know that SO2z is generated by two moves. One is tau to tau plus one. We call it the T transformation most of the time. And then the other is
a negative reflection. Well, to be honest, it generates P as a 2Z, but it's okay. It's a, it's a harmless lie. So this is our fundamental domain, right? All other points is mapped uh, via uh, 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 these moves to a point in this box. So to say, to s say that, uh, to check that this function is invariant under SO2Z, you just have to check that they're invariant under this. And there's actually a unique such function that goes like Q to the, where Q is e to the 2 pi i tau as you go to the cusp infinity, right? Or, yeah, or a low, low temperature limit if that makes people happier. So how do you see that it's unique? Well, one way to see that it's unique is the following. Because this fundamental domain, if you compactify it and put in some points, is actually a Riemann sphere. So, you just have to say, show that J, the J function uh, acts as a, as a, as a, as a isomorphism between the two spheres. So this pole will come to, like, become the point at infinity here, is this. And then you need to specify three parameters, right, for every isomorphism. Then you specify, you know, the location of the pole is here, and the coefficient, and the next term, it has to vanish, right? It starts positive with the positive powers of Q, and you're done with uniqueness. So how many more minutes do I have? 12. OK, great. And another cool thing about the, the, this function, there are many, many cool things. The first thing is why it's so important is actually it's unique. And uh, a consequence is that all SO2Z invariant functions are ratios of polynomials of this. So you can see this showing up, for instance, in your F-theory lectures, I believe. So that's really the canonical object. And another thing is that now let's write down this Fourier expansion. So, does this number look familiar? So it's almost the same as this number. So we can identify this coefficient 1 as the dimension of the trivial. So this is the dimension of the trivial and the first non-trivial guy. And this is actually So this equation, so the, 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 the start of monstrous moonshine started with uh, the so-called McKay equation, which says 196AA4 equals 1 plus 196AA3. <laughs> and people went on to do the game for other uh, representations. And it was, a sensation, it was sensational because J function is such a canonical object in the study of modular forms or in uh, number theory in general and has a lot of applications in the study of uh, geometry. And it turns out to have this weird relation with this oddball that's called the monster group that was, yeah, and imagine that at that time the monster group was conjectured to exist. It hasn't been proven to exist. But it has, but people also conjecture that if it exists, it have to have certain 
um, certain uh, properties, and with that properties, people computed the first few numbers that shows up here, and all of a sudden, it was observed that it has something to do with this very canonical object, and that was sort of the hint of moonshine. It's unique if I specify this behavior at I infinity. Otherwise, as you said, every chiral CFD that's self-dual will have this partition function. And we'll have partition functions that are, what did I say, ratios of polynomials of this guy. So that's very powerful this uniqueness, as we will give you an example later. Okay, so the usual way to present the story from now on is then I tell you what mathematicians did subse subsequently after this amazing observation and how do they prove it and in the end what the relationship is to physics. Um, but um, but uh, one over delta. Yeah. Well, one over delta. No. Okay. So one over delta has a weight. Okay. What does that mean? What does that mean? It has a weight. And I'll tell you why it's not modular invariant. Right, because, well, this is, v as you can see from the uh, uniqueness, modularity is very, very constraining, but you can get more interesting objects that you actually need in CFT if you allow the function not just to depend on the shape of the lattice, which is given by this tau parameter, but also the size of the, of, of the, of the lattice, right? So if you, so let's call this function uh, f and lambda is a lattice, and if you allowed it to rescale like the function to rescale like lambda to the power k, if you rescale the lattice, then you get the concepts of modular forms with a non-trivial weight k, okay? And for instance, 1 over delta, the 24, free 24 bosons will then have a weight for the reason that you will see and I will remind you in three minutes, if that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, how would this coincidence obtain, like, uh, yeah, like so, uh, I, I guess you are just matching, you find them out somehow and then they agree with Mm -hmm. so, so these coefficients are well known. Okay, this function, this function people have known for a long time. I can actually give you, for instance, some closed form formula for it if you want. If I can get the, so let's go. to the power, what's the power, 24, I think, yeah, and then minus 744, if you want to check on Mathematica, I think this will give you these numbers. Any more questions? Uh, 1 to infinity. Yeah, so this pattern breaks. So what is believed to be true, and right now we, we, we know it's true, that let's call this Cn q to the n. And then uh, there,
and the conjecture which is true in two ways is that there exists a monster representation such that the dimension of Vn is Cn, where C is defined by ex putting that in Mathematica, and, uh, and uh, this is some representation. But this is a stupid conjecture, because of course it's true. Because, because we have one-dimensional irreducible representation. But don't worry, that's not the, that's not what Monstrous Moonshine is about. There will be a, a meaningful conjecture, which is also true, fortunately. More question about this? Well, as I just said, it's not because. All right. So then, then you have to define what what do you mean by taking out, but. I promise you, there's a nice, there's a meaningful conjecture I'm going to write down, and the, and the, and the representation, if it exists, is unique. Okay, anything else? Yeah. That's right. You can quite easily see that by. Um, sort of a refined version of Cardi formula. Okay? Um, so, as I said, um, I'm going to introduce monstrous moonshine in a bit of different ways because um, Hopefully, in a way that I'll, I'll now talk a little bit about physics, and hopefully after that, uh, you will all guess what the story, true story of Monster of Moonshine is, without me telling you. Because as I was advertising, once you know the physics, it's actually not as shocking as it appeared. And also through this way, hopefully you will see um, a bit more clearly what the current challenges are uh, to understand the new cases of moonshine. So the third topic is um, going to be to the CFT, especially the orbifold construction. And uh, I'm lucky because Sheen has taught a lot about it to the CFT already. So I can just, you know, be very brief and just wave my hand and draw some pictures and <laughs> hopefully. So the f for our purpose, we want to know what modular invariance comes from and how it generalizes to different cases. So just a quick reminder. Well, let's, t let's, let's think about uh, the partition function and imagine if we have left and right movers, okay? And uh, in the canonical quantization, in the canonical picture, this is defined as a trace over your Hilbert space, right? And then uh, you have like the left and right moving uh, Hamiltonian, or in other words, you have like something that's given by phi tau 2, 2 pi i tau 1 plus the the momentum 
right? And then I'm splitting the tau into the real and the imaginary part. And uh, so you know all this very well. So um, just to remind you, the basic story, I, I actually use a more sort of geometric pictures, but the upshot will extend, will be applicable to non-geometric CFTs as well, but this is just for, for, for convenience. So since we have a one plus one theory, and then uh, so the Hilbert space is constructed by, uh, for instance, by uh, quantizing the space of mapping the one-dimensional space, which is a, a loop in this case, to some space M, okay? So such a space of maps is called the loop, loop space of M. And then if you quantize it, then you get the Hilbert space, okay? That's in this scenario, it looks like this. So then, then you take the trace, and then you realize that you can rewrite this as q to the uh, l naught minus c over 24, and q bar to the l naught. Right? While q is again defined as the exponential of tau. But you also have a picture of doing a path integral. So you identify these two sides, right? And then so you're mapping, you're summing, your, your path integral is over, you know, mapping a torus with a given, given, given complex structure and uh, weighted by the action. Right, just because if you have a cylinder and you glue it, that becomes a torus. And here, the modular invariance can be pictorially understood as the fact that uh, SO2Z leaves a torus invariant. So you get the conclusion that this has to be the same when you do the two together when you do this, mapping the tau and tau bar in this way. Okay, so um, that's easy. So um, just, uh, just an example to answer someone's question about one over delta. Then uh, for a free boson, well, let's, uh, let's just say that M1 uh, is, well, let's say R. So you have a free boson theory. And then the Hilbert space is given by, of course, you have many oscillators, something of this form, and the zero modes momentum. So if you take the trace, now we can compute this. This is given by and this is modular invariant, right? So this part comes from you know, integrating over the zero modes, and this part comes from C over 24, and this part comes from the oscillator modes. Okay, so very simple example. So for our purpose, we want to some, uh, do something uh, a little bit uh, different, a little bit more. We want to have a more refined version of m modular invariance to connect to monstrous moonshine. 
And in order to do that, we already know that our problem has a finite group symmetry. So the question is what we can do when your theory has a finite group symmetry. Well, that brings me to the topic of, you know, the twisted sectors of CFDs and orbifold. By the way, if you look at the monstrous moonshine literature, people usually talk about vertex operator algebras, but uh, since I'm teaching Tassi, I'll avoid uh, using that language. But it's, everything should be understandable in terms of CFD language. So for instance, they will call this the twisted module of your chiral algebra and so on. Okay, so what can you do? So let's again give you, uh, take an example, a geometric orbifold example, just because that's easier to explain, but we don't have to be. So for instance, there I call my target space M, and imagine that M has a finite group symmetry. So the loop space, so the space you have before you quantize the theory, also will inherit the group action. And after quantization, you say that the group will also act on your Hilbert space. Moreover, if everything's all right, you see that the G action uh, commutes with the Virasoro symmetry of the CFT. So it acts on each component, the eigenspace of the Hilbert space. So what you can do, apart from computing the partition function, You can compute this, this trace. Well, it's well defined, right? Because this commutes with what's here and what's here. So how about the modular invariance? Let's go back to that de the derivation of modular invariance and see what changes. So now, if you want to, and this, I'll call this, I'll write it like this. So in this box notation, that's when both sides have identity. So why do I write this? Because if you want to write this as a path integral, you're summing over map into your target space that has a twisted boundary condition or a twined boundary condition, namely that this is still, oh, I kept s writing one for identity, but this is still, uh, is it better? So this is still uh, periodic under this, uh, when you go around this spatial circle, but no longer so when you go over the, 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 the time circle. That's what inserting this guy in the trace means. So you, now you get a torus with decorations, right? So SO2Z will no longer be the relevant thing to consider. For instance, if you do an S transformation, tau going to minus 1 over tau, it corresponds to taking this torus with this generator and making something different out of it, right? So uh, this will be the new generator. 
So you're exchanging time and space circle, more or less. Right? So if you do an S transformation, <coughs> you'll get G downstairs on the spatial circle and E identity on the spatial, on the time circle, temporal circle. Oh, is it that bad? Even you cannot see. Ah. Oh. This. Okay, help me to draw a cutoff, a wall. It's hopeless? Okay, then, then just keep coming. <laughs> you can walk around here, it's okay. Right, so I mean, so then if we consider the SO2 Z transformation, it's also natural to considering changing the boundary condition here. That has the interpretation of what's called the twisted sector. So to use again the geometric language to see uh, what the twisted sector is, let's consider the geometric orbifold of this, of this, of this target space, right? So that means if two points x and x prime are related by a g action, you identify them. So then you're looking at, if you look at the loop space, you're looking at maps into the original target, but you allow for a twisted boundary condition. And so this decomposes into pieces like this. Which is defined in terms of the twisted boundary condition. So the interesting thing is if you um, look at such a twisted boundary condi condition, it has a residual symmetry. Right? It's not the whole symmetry anymore, but the residual symmetry is given by the centralizer, what's called the centralizer of the group element. So this is defined as element that commutes with H. Because you can check that if you act on phi with H, so namely for each point, each point on the loop, on the, on, the, on, the, on the image of M, you act on it by G, because they commute, so they again belong to the same loop subspace, okay? So hence you can compute not just the S transformation of this, which is the H-twisted sector after quantizing this subspace. And then the same thing. And you can also consider H and G by inserting G here, OK? So now I have a redundant equal sign, but that's not illegal. Hopefully you get the idea. So from the torus picture, we know how it transforms. It transforms like the following. I just uh, I just erase this redundant thing and make it into something meaningful. G A B. I have to get my A B. Yeah, G A. This is nothing but using the same argument with decorated torus. Right? Because before you're looking at this, 
And now let's say you want to change your generator of the lattice or change the way you slice your bagel by choosing this as the basis, right? And then, of course, it carries a new boundary condition by going this and this. And it only makes sense, it's only meaningful because we have required a G and H commute. Well, another way to say this or to look at this, if you're more familiar with defects, is that you wrap around line operators separating, separating the boundaries, uh, the separating the different phases with like G and H tagged in that. And the phase and the defect lines can cross only if you go around, you get identity. That's another picture you can use. But this is simple to draw. <laughs> well, so that's one thing that will be relevant for the, for the monster story. And another thing, since I ran out of space, I jumped back. I apologize for people over there. Uh, another thing you can do is you can come up with a new theory called the orbifold theory. By putting different twisted sectors together, I'm already implicitly doing this. But now, what you have to do is to take the sum into account, right? So you take the sum into account. And on top of that, what you need to do is to project out states that are not invariant on the G itself. So you get something like, so you sum over twisted sectors. So, so this sum <coughs> and this sum is sum over what commutes with it for the reason that I said before and you do this and you do the sum that will give you the number of final states in the orbital theory. Okay? This is a slight lie. <laughs> the light is not that severe. You might have phases here, depending on GH, sometimes called the discrete torsion. It's related to the fact, the following fact. It's not central, so if you want to take a break, it's a nice time. But um, the fact that what I draw here Right? It's actually some representation of the group, right? Not, not the group as abstract group itself, right? It's some representation acting on the theory, acting on the space. And sometimes it happens that this representation is only projective representation. So rho of g times rho of h equals rho of g times h only up to a phase. And that phase is related to the things that can happen here. But I want to give you an example of the orbifold theory, which hopefully will give you a happy feeling um, of like being closer and closer to understanding monstrous moonshine. And then it will be a good time to stop, I think. Right? Yeah. We're supposed to have like two minutes left. We started a few minutes left. OK, we should wrap up. Yeah. So I'll be really quick because you can actually find this example in she's lecture notes. But I don't think he talked about it. I'm looking at him. So I'm going to do, do, do his job for him. <laughs> so Let's take a bunch of free bosons and now chiral bosons. So we forget about right movers. Sometimes you can get away with it, like in this case. And often this will make me very happy. 
and so 24 free bosons okay but it's kind of boring uh, so let's consider a non-compact target space so we mod out by our favorite leech lattice so this is a specific 24 dimensional torus the leech torus if you want and then we consider a symmetry that as as uh, as easy as it could be which is generated by an order two of course an order two element that's just reflecting all the 24 bosons and let's look at the partition function of the original theory forgetting about G and we know that when you have a torus like this you get your usual oscillator part in this case 24 so here you get your favorite delta M but you also get the contribution from the winding and so on so you get the theta function of the leech lattice so if theta function of lattice is you sum over lattice points and uh, you take the norm squared and you divide by 2 so first it is a partition function of a CFT so it's SO2Z invariant and this theta function of course doesn't have poles at I infinity so you start with Q to the minus 1 so then we're almost at a J function because of uniqueness but there's a constant term a constant piece as opposed to the J function and we know what the constant piece is because there's no uh, norm square term here right because of its leech no roots so there's no constant piece coming off that so it's just a constant piece that comes from here so so this is j plus 24 now you see how powerful the uniqueness can be used in real life computation and to apply that formula we have to sum over three other pieces so the full story uh, the full partition function let me call that this the FLM partition function which I will explain later is given by 1 over the size of G so 1 over 2 and okay this we have computed and this well we have a minus uh, boundary condition on the spatial circle so that will kill all the, the lattice par part and put a plus sign here oh, sorry right and because if you have odd number of oscillators you get a minus sign and here you get in the twisted sector you get antiperiodic bosons so that's like a fermion so you get the zero mode and this works other way here and the mode 
grading is a bit di different. So you have 24 of them. Uh, am I screwing up something? Yes, I think so. Uh, two square, that's how fermionic zero mode works. So you pair them up. And if you have this, you get the same thing, but with this plus sign, but there's a choice you can make on how G acts on the ground state. So you make a choice such that this is um, plus and the rest is the same, okay? I think this is right. So you, again, you split it into two parts. Yeah. And then if you put everything together, the net effect is just that you kill the 24 and you get a J function. So this is a relatively simple uh, CFT that was constructed by uh, Franco, Lesposky, and Merman in the mid-80s after monstrous moonshine because people are looking for systems, algebras, or whatever that, um, <coughs> that relates to the J function in a natural way. And this is the Cairo CFT or Cairo algebra that they came up with. Um, so that will be the end of my first lecture. Yeah, that's a name. That's the name for three gentlemen: Edward Franco. Huh? There are two Francos, and uh, oh, did I say Edward? Oh my God, no! <laughs> they are really different, except for <laughs> well, Edward also. Well, le le and they both work on, they both have done a lot of work on uh, vertex operator algebra to make things worse. So this is Igor Franco. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so I think it's about, the book is about 84. I might be a few years off. Don't kill me on that. Um, so that's what FLM stands for. So, so huh? It's not really. Uh, okay, yeah, first, um, first, it's, it's a, a historical remark. Um, so they developed uh, the, Cairo, the, the Cairo CFD in the language of vertex operator algebra independently of physicists. Well, not just they, before them there's Borchert, there was Borchert and other people. And, and Cuts also played an important role. So indeed, their consideration, their language was pretty different from, from a physics language, and certainly there's no Lagrangian showing up. And second, you're saying that, oh, how do I um, see this torus uh, computation? Indeed, so strictly speaking, it's not. That's why um, mathematicians uh, needed an indep independent proof of modular invariance. So the state that is, well, I'm not going into the detail. We can talk about that later, but after FLM, there's um, uh, Igor's student, what's Drew. Uh, Drew had the theorem proving the modular invariance for this theory, and of course for in many other classes of theory. So classes in our language are with classes of Cairo CFTs satisfying certain conditions. Yeah, but I mean, not just orbifold, right? Any 
VOA in general will have the Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What the total number of thirty seconds? Two. I mean identity and in gen for a general group, that's the number of the number of conjug conjugacy classes or number of group elements, depending on a little bit on how of course, but then they're equivalent. You get equivalent copies. Yeah. That's the series of copies of the Sorry. Um, I want to tell you that what I said was also a lie. <laughs> <laughs> if you have uh, projective representations and so on, then you can get faces and so on. But uh, yeah, but uh, and then you have to be careful with the face in front of it. Uh, but but eventually it all works out. Uh, to back to your question, no, it is an infinite um, series. <coughs> so the dimension. So indeed, it 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 w will stop being one to one plus two plus three, one plus two plus three plus four. No, that's not the general pattern. The the one thing that's really significant is that there exists a representation. Yeah, um, your change of constant. It would change the constant. Yeah. So then. But you can still do the same thing, and often you get something interesting. Okay. So then the only reason we need to leave flat is in particular so that the 24 can't be the other. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and if the hindsight, the punchline is this uh, conformal field theory has monster symmetry. If you start with other things, you won't have. Well. You mean like uh, it's dual to a C equals 24 uh, 3D gravity? Yeah. So yeah. So there there are statements like this. But um, well, we can talk about details later. But the first thing you have to keep in mind is that um, C over 24 equals one is really not weakly coupled gravity or anything resembling that because um, it's extremely quantum. So how much of the um, gravity intuition you can use? Well, you can say many things about it, but uh, I mean, I think that's one thing clearly that we should be careful with. I don't know if she has better comments on that. Yeah. Well, let's thank Miranda. <laughs>